and welcome to episode 133 of the Power Score LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kaloran in Napa Valley. And this is John Denning down in Los Angeles. John, are you down in Los Angeles or just down in Los Angeles? Yeah, I get how that could be a bit misleading. I am certainly not down in mood. I'm south of you, but I'm in a pretty good mood today because this episode topic has given me a great excuse, or at least all the excuse I needed. To pour myself a tall glass of scotch. Well, I guess that gets the first order of business underway. If you're drinking scotch, what kind is it? Yeah, given the topic and what we're going to talk about today, the kind of surprising frequency with which things get reused on this test, I went all the way back to episode one to see what I had started this shenanigans with and realized that my most common drink, and certainly the one that kicked things off, was a Macallan 12. So 12-year-old scotch from Macallan, pretty top shelf stuff. I'm certainly excited about it. So down in Los Angeles, but up in spirits. What about you? Up in up in spirits, almost literally. Almost literally. I guess more figuratively. Uh, I'm doing well, actually. And I took a cue from you because you went back to episode one. I did as well. And of course, that means it's a white Russian for me. So it's already a great day. <laughs> and This nod to history that we're doing is built around this discussion that we're going to have about tracking the usage of one reading comprehension passage through time, which probably on the surface of it doesn't sound that exciting, but I think actually will turn out to be very interesting and also informative and maybe give a little bit of a lens into how you and I ultimately make our crystal ball predictions, how we put together some of our recommended problem sets. So I think the insight there is uh, going to be helpful for those who have wondered how we do a little bit of what we do and what level of information we have about uh, some of the test information that's floating around out there. Yeah, some of the most common questions I get, frankly, is how do you guys do what you do? Not just in terms of the accuracy of our prediction, but just where do you get this stuff from? How do you know? Today, we won't, yeah. we're not going to show all our cards. Uh, we'll keep some secrets, but today I think I'll at least help people get their head around the process to a certain degree. We'll give a look at maybe one card in the deck. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) But the music is a little bit more on a somber note. As some of you may have seen in the news, Tina Turner has died. And so we uh, flipped the script on what we were going to choose from a music standpoint and uh, have gone over to choosing one of her songs. And John, I don't think either you or I have a deep knowledge of her catalog, but certainly we know a few of the songs that are out there. She had enough hits that it'd be hard to miss, at least, you know, the big three or four. The one we picked was uh, the song called The Best. I always thought it was simply the best, but there you go. Displaying my ignorance. (laughs) That's what you think of when you think of that song. And there were others that we could have gone down the pathway of choosing, certainly uh, worldwide renowned for her. But that's the choice we've made. So it's a little bit of a throwback episode because, you know, we're starting to see some of these older uh, stars, David Bowie being a great example, who have passed away in the last year or so. And so kind of like going back in time matches what we're drinking. It also matches really the topic of this. So perhaps everything kind of came together, even if that's a bit macabre. A little bit. It does feel about once a month we do a tribute song. So uh, stay alive out there, you <laughs> you ancient rock gods. Let's get into the LSAT world and start off with really the, the biggest, most important upcoming event here, which is the June LSAT, which is coming up on Friday, June 9th, and Saturday, June 10th. Registration has already passed for that, so if you haven't registered, you can't add to it. The next test you'd be able to add to uh, would, in fact, be August. But that June test is in the middle of the month, and then the scores are released at the end of June on the 28th. Uh, at 9 a.m. in the morning. And people taking June are often set up for the fall, but there are a number of students still taking this to get off wait lists as well as to improve their reconsideration uh, position. And we just did a, a podcast episode a few ago on reconsideration if you're in that position right now. As far as the size of June, What we know is that last year you had about 16,000 people who took this test. The test this year is going to be bigger. Uh, A couple weeks ago, the count was about 27,500. Right now, we're down to about 25,900 as of today. 
And that's a natural melt that we see where you lose uh, maybe 100, 150 applicants a day out of taking the test. And sometimes that's because they got off the wait list, so they don't feel like they need to take it again. Or maybe they've postponed until August. Lots of different reasons. But if you are taking that June test, we've got a couple of things that will help you. First off, from a free seminar standpoint, uh, if if you're a June taker, hopefully you were at our mini ball, the <laughs> kind of like June LSAT, the April and and, uh, June LSAT crystal ball revisited that we did recently that is focused solely on predictions built around the June test. If you are a PowerScore student, that is in your online student center. And by PowerScore student, I mean you've taken a course with us, you've gone and done tutoring, you're in an analytics package. If you're not, there are some free webinars coming up. On June 6th, there's a Logic Games webinar about templates. On June 20th, there is a Logical Reasoning webinar about parallel reasoning. And then, John, a very interesting event that has just been added to the roster. Yes, indeed. You and I back in the saddle, as it turns out. Uh, I'm going to need more scotch. On the 29th of June, we are doing another crystal ball. And it's going to be a monster in terms of size, I think, because this one's for two of the biggest tests of the year. This will be for August and September LSATs. And this will go back to the full-scale production that people who've attended these are used to. So the mini ball was kind of a tapered down, very focused, tailored thing that we did. This crystal ball here in June for August and September is going to cover each section. It's going to talk about topics and concepts and themes that we expect to appear, frequency of question types. Uh, It's going to go into all of that good stuff and, of course, wrap up with test predictions and reuses, like we'll talk about today, uh, towards the end of that. And I think that's where a lot of your kind of thunder really comes through. You you always get the luxury of getting to close these things out with the test predictions. And I say luxury because you've been so right so many times in a row that <laughs> it, it kind of feels like, uh, well, you're infallible, Dave. No, that's not the case. Uh, we know that I'm not. Uh, my wife would be the first to say like, mm-mm. <laughs> definitely fallible over there. Uh, And honestly, you give me too much credit because both you and I participate in those predictions and uh, kind of formulations there. But interestingly enough, with the June LSAT scores coming out on the 28th, this uh, kind of full crystal ball is on the 29th. And I will kind of highlight that difference that you talked about. The special mini ball, the revisited version that we did just for June, that only applies to the June test. So what we will do is once we see that test go through, we'll kind of reformulate everything that we've done, rebuild the predictions, the probabilities, all those types of things. And then that will apply to both August and September. Uh, Whether or not there is a mini ball for September, once, you know, August has passed, we'll have to see about that. It really depends upon what they do, how we feel about it. But I don't know whether or not this will be free to the public after that first night. It may just go on to the PowerScore Online Student Centers. Right now, I'm getting a lot of questions about the June mini ball, and I'm like, you can only get it as a PowerScore student. But that first night on the 29th at 8 p.m. Eastern, it is free to the public, free to register. And you can go to powerscore.com forward slash free seminar. So that's fair warning. Uh, John, there will be several thousand people there that night uh, with us, which is always cool. It's probably the biggest event besides the actual LSAT that happens on a yearly basis. Uh, And then there's, of course, there's more free seminars after that. In July, you've got a reading comprehension comparative passages uh, webinar. So we really are able to cover a lot of ground in these webinars. If you are taking one of these upcoming tests, Register for those. Come visit us. Sometimes it's John and I. Sometimes it's some of our other ACE instructors. But we are out there trying to help out and uh, get you ready for each one of these tests that's coming up. Speaking of out there and trying to help out, do you want to mention the uh, the kind of surprise that you and I were just dealt? Uh, I love it. That was a really nice transition. Thank you. Uh, marketing has surprised us with a uh, a sudden flash sale. Uh, on tutoring, on-demand courses, and live online courses. Right now, if you go to the PowerScore site, they are 25% off. That will only last for a few more days. This runs through the end of May, and then that sale goes away. I have no idea if or when another sale will actually come up. This was a surprise to us. We're kind of like a little gift given to us by the marketing department here. Always welcome. I'll always take those from them. 
So on that note, that gives you a lot of options in terms of preparation, in terms of kind of engaging with us as you move towards these June, August, and September LSATs. And as always, we're here to help. And one of the ways we try to help is in those crystal balls, we talk about what we know about the LSAT, what LSAC actually does, and how things might look going forward. So let's get into the discussion about LSAT history a little bit. And I'm going to give a little bit of background, John. Yeah, you should. Uh, interject if you feel like it, but certainly uh, I'll, I'll uh, kind of give the history of where we're coming at here. This past weekend, I was spending a lot of time looking over various LSAT questions in our archive, discussions of various tests and performances there, and just kind of looking over some of the notes that we have. And uh, I was looking at the discussion of the UNESCO Shipwrecks Passage. Oh, yeah. Which is one that if you have taken PT93, Prep Test 93+, plus, it's actually on that test. It is in Section 1, and it is Passage 3. It's about shipwrecks. It's about UNESCO rules and so forth. And uh, I knew that was obviously on a release test, and I was looking back at some of our notes about it. And I realized, I was like, this is a really interesting passage to talk about because we have been seeing it for almost 15 years at this point. Uh, and it's now out in the public, so it's not going to be reused again. But we thought we could use this as a lens into how LSAC works in terms of, you know, a little bit about creation as well as reuse. And then also how much information that we have about some of these uh, test elements to kind of give maybe a little bit of comfort and as well as understanding as to what it is that we do in these crystal balls and our recommended problem sets. So I'm just going to focus on a single reading comprehension passage. Uh, when we first encountered it, how many times they used it, things that we know about it. And part of the lesson that we hope to you know, teach here is that it's really easy to think that this is a new test mm -hmm. um, and that this is therefore a new passage. It is not. And also sometimes you see it, it come out and a lot of times people think, well, it's just a one-off. They use it one time and they're done with it. That is not how this works. And this is one of the reasons that we have an advantage and a demonstrable one in predicting what they do and kind of helping our students prepare for each individual test. So if you haven't done the passage yet, this is okay. We're only gonna briefly talk about it. We're not gonna talk about any of the questions. We're not gonna talk about any of the answer choices. So you can continue listening even if you haven't done that test. Uh, you should at some point take that <laughs> yes, though, because it is the most recently released test. And so. this is a great passage, period. It's kind of distinctive, as you're about to explain, I think. Um, we could have really done this with all sorts of things, particularly distinctive elements that we've been able to catch as they've come up and up and up, as they've kind of bobbed their heads above water over and over through the years. This passage was just clearly something that caught your eye, and it served as the genesis of this. Uh, although I will say it's funny picturing you on the weekend in our, quote, archives. The, the visual I get, you know that scene at the end of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? where they're taking the ark kind of on that trolley into that warehouse and it just keeps panning out and out and out. That's a little bit like how this feels. We've just got a Costco worth of <laughs> worth of old information and archives on tests from, God, even back into the mid, early 2000s, if not earlier. So You know what's really inaccurate? Or really accurate about that visual is the idea that there's no way I can explore even all of it no. in the four or five hours I spent this weekend. I was actually looking for some very specific things relating to uh, upcoming test predictions, and I just started down a really rabbit hole of looking at that UNESCO passage and looking at some of the notes that we had on it over the years, and then I went back and I redid the passage. Uh, but it literally is like that. The archive that we have is... Uh, obviously, it's digital, so it's a, a series of records in a database and so forth, but it really stems out to, I don't know, seven or 800 pages worth of material at the least. Oh, yeah, minimum. Uh, yeah, it's probably, it's probably well over into the thousands, but I was only looking at maybe 30 or 40 pages specifically as I was kind of going through this. But one of the lessons that comes out of this is you see a, a released passage like this, and it's not just that you think that it's over and done with, but it's hard to realize that it was reused over and over by the test makers. And so that's really what we want to highlight. So let's first talk about PT93. 
And um, just that RC passage in very, very generalized detail. Right now, when you look at that, there are four passages in that section. This is section uh, one. The first one is about freedom riders, which we'll mention again because it's kind (laughs) of interesting uh, how that figures in pairing with this passage. The second one is about prescriptive versus descriptive grammarians. The third is the shipwrecks passage that we're going to focus on. And then the fourth one is about international debt and environmentalists making a claim. So these are the four passages that are actually sitting there. That third one about shipwrecks is actually the comparative passage. So there are two short sub passages. No, you know, no mystery there. When you see comparative, you know, there's two passages. The first one is essentially drawn from a newspaper article. It's about the HMS Sussex and raising that and some of the implications both financially and from a cultural standpoint of doing so. And then passage B is from a UNESCO convention draft paper, and it has essentially seven numbered principles. And so it's really kind of cool. Passage B is really the principles of, of how you think about this. Passage A is almost the application right. and you know some of the gray area issues with it. So kind of a classic format principle and application that's floating around there. But B is just a list of rules. So it's a very unique looking passage within reading comprehension annals. Yeah, I can tell you really enjoyed it. Uh, you've certainly done it more recently than I have. I I found this passage interesting. I don't know if I enjoyed it to quite the extent that you did. In fact, I'm certain I didn't. Um, but I, I did take a slightly different approach, I think, than you probably did, which is that as soon as I saw the nature of passage B, that numbered list of what were clearly like broad rules, I read passage B first. To me, I wanted that kind of framework of what are the rules that are governing things, expecting, since I've seen this kind of construction before, that passage A would be exactly what it is, which is the application of those rules, um, what applies, what doesn't, and what kind of takeaways or outcomes that those rules would produce, or those principles would produce. So I I actually swapped the order that I read the passages in um, intentionally. It helped me, although I will admit I haven't tried it the other way, so it's hard to compare. But I found that that made it a little bit easier to process the relationship between the two. Interestingly enough, I did not do it that way. And partially because I saw that passage A was from a newspaper and B was from a UNESCO convention draft. And I thought, gee, the newspaper is going to be more interesting to read. And it is definitely more of a story format. Uh, So I just dove right into that and enjoyed it. That's kind of thing is interesting to me. Although I don't know a tremendous amount about it. It is kind of cool and about then, shipwreck and sunken treasures and stuff like that. That's kind of cool. Who owns it? Mm-hmm. Hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, honestly, to me, if uh, England sent off a big ship full of gold and it sank off the coast of Florida or it sank in the middle of the Atlantic, mm-hmm. I don't think England owns it anymore. If they've left it there for you know a couple hundred years personally, but... Uh, that's apparently not how the lawmakers or the world cultural heritage uh, actually focus on. And the UNESCO part is a lot about underwater cultural heritage heritage and recovering things like that and where they should go. So it's kind of interesting there it's, as it's well. But I think you mentioned England is that is the most like, <laughs> I think England thinks they still own us. So I'm sure that they would lay claim to some sort of sunken Floridian shipwreck. I'm not sure they want to own us any longer. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. So that's a that's a different issue. Um, but interestingly enough, when you go back and you look at this passage, that gives you a sense of what it is that we're looking at. And here it is. It's released on PT93. John, we first saw this passage way back in February of 2009. And so that obviously spans quite a number of years. And when it first appeared in February 2009, it wasn't scored. We saw it then as an experimental section. And so that's kind of like the first thing is we have some of these archives that go back decades in terms of tracking this. And as we will see, this that wasn't just the first usage and the last usage. It came up again and again, and we'll detail that momentarily. But the important thing was is that when they came first put it out there, they did not use this entire section as it finally was released. 
this was actually presented along with other passages that were obviously also experimental. And some of those eventually made their way to the LSAT. For example, there was one about prions Mm -hmm. uh, that we've seen multiple times uh, that came through. And so that's one of the first lessons that you can take away from this is, you know, they threw a bunch of passages together and said, here's an experimental section. They didn't keep that section in that format. Sometimes they do, uh, but they didn't in this case. They took that passage and paired it with other ones. And in fact, we'll come back to that point as well. But a lot of times people think of like the LSAT almost being fully birthed in adult form. It is not. It is a process of mixing and matching and running the analytics and saying, how does this work with this? How does this passage work with that to get the statistical profile that they want? And they do that with logic games and logical reasoning as well. Yeah. I want to make a, a quick point on this just to clarify in case there's any confusion for people. What you're talking about when you say that these experimental sections, reading comp, games, LR, don't have to exist in their sort of original conception forever, that they can take pieces in and out, they can change things. That holds true over time, but it doesn't hold true from what we've seen at least for a single administration. So in other words, I haven't seen uh, two experimental reading comprehension sections on the same test date where they're like mixed and matched. So I don't want people to get that impression. Gotcha. That makes sense, yeah. No, no, it makes total sense. And of course, some people might say, well, you know, how do you even know it was on February 2009 when we were talking to students back then? It wasn't released, though, because February 2009 by itself was a non-disclosed LSAT at the time. So they didn't give out that information. We just happened to know from talking to students about which sections they had. We knew which one was scored. Uh, It was very easy back then to determine that because everybody had the same four scored sections. And then the fifth section they would have that would be different would be the experimental section. And by fifth, I mean in any one of the five places because the LSAT was constructed differently back then. So it was really easy to figure out, hey, everybody had this reading comp, everybody had this games and so on and know what was scored. But they didn't release it. But we were able to start t- developing a record of that passage to understand some of the questions that were being asked, to understand the nature of each of uh, passage A and passage B. So then when they finally used it for real for the first time, it was then on the February 2011 LSAT. So exactly two years after mm-hmm. it showed up as an experimental. And that's another lesson I think it's an interesting takeaway. Sometimes the spin-up time People would think, well, they test these questions for five or six years. No, we've seen them spin it up in, you know, 14 to uh, 18 months before. This was a two-year horizon. And back then, there were only four LSATs a year, so they didn't have to make that many. Now they have to make a lot more LSATs than they did before, which is why we're seeing a lot of reuses. But the February 2011 LSAT also non-disclosed. So we knew they were using it. We knew this UNESCO shipwrecks passage was floating around and being used as a scored section because everybody had it on that test. But again, we didn't see it at that point. No one could say, here's the text of it. They don't release that. That's what non-disclosed actually means. All right. So and now, now, we've taken now here's where things get interesting, I think. That's exactly right. We've gone from the first appearance in February 2009 as an experimental to the the first scored appearance in February 2011. And of course, after two times of seeing it, we had a pretty good sense of what it was about. We already had developed a lot of information. The notes that we have from back then are voluminous in their detail about what was being talked about, uh, even down to, you know, kind of like a paragraph by paragraph level. So was that it? No. And the next part to me was the most interesting one, because what it highlights is that since the test was non-disclosed and they hadn't given it back to test takers, but they'd run it through a substantial test population with that February 2011 test, they now had enough data on it where they were comfortable reusing it. And John, reuse it, they did. Oh, yeah. They used it 10 more times between that initial appearance in February 2011 all the way up into 2022 prior to its re, uh, actual release in the fall of 2022. And I'm going to detail some of those, and then I'm going to detail a little interesting history thing about the passages around it, because they locked in the, the passages, uh, essentially, and kept reusing them until they made a change. But this test was f- that we see showed up in January of 2014 as a makeup LSAT. Then it showed up in October of 2017 as a digital pilot test reading comprehension section. 
Then it popped up in June 2020 uh, as an LSAT flex test, primarily on day one. Then they used it in July 2020 as an LSAT flex makeup test. Uh, They used it in October 8th, 2020 as an LSAT flex international test. Then October 14th, that same administration as a paper makeup test. Then you see it in November of 2020 as an accommodated test, (laughs) again on the flex format. And then that same administration, they use it as a makeup test as well. And then in January of 2022, it was a makeup test again. And then in April of 2022, uh, just a year ago, it was again a makeup. And so you can see that there's really a lot of different ways that they use it. It was a main administration. It was an international test. It was a paper test. It was a makeup test multiple times. That's how LSATs get reused. It's not that they give it as a huge administration every time, although they have done that. Uh, They use it in all these little slices, and that's to kind of make sure that people haven't seen the same test. They have to be careful about that. They don't want to re-administer a test to you. Yeah, there's a stretch of time here, too, that really catches my eye, which is that June 2020 appearance, the first day of that LSAT flex, through November 2020 and the makeup, uh, the last day, really, of that LSAT flex. It appeared six times in those, what is that, five months or so? That five-month window, they used this test six times. And what that really, to me, speaks to is, A, how comfortable they are with these non-disclosed tests being reused, repurposed, sent around to people again, but also how desperate in some ways they are for content when it comes to filling in these oddball gaps, like a test center closure or some sort of an accommodated test or an international or a makeup or something. They're clearly um, at a bit, I think, uh, of a, a dearth of new tests to use or new content to use, which is why they keep dusting off the same old thing. Six times in five months, that almost speaks of a certain type of desperation to me. It's like, use, I it, think, use it again, know, use it again, use it again. This, John, is in fact why the crystal ball was ultimately born out in that kind of like 2020 yeah. uh, era is that we saw something that was happening, and this will perhaps give people an understanding of why we're capable of doing what we're doing. Prior to that, with the LSAT only four times a year and everybody getting the same test, you don't know which test they're going to pick. They had a number of different exams to choose from. Trying to figure out or predict that was just an impossible game. We didn't even you know, do it other than internally just to see if we could do it. But when you got to the 2020 era, you had two things happen. And this really created the kind of era that we're in now where we've had a really good understanding of how to predict what they're doing and we can see the patterns that they use. The first one was that they actually increased the number of LSATs. Mm -hmm. Instead of four times a year, you had eight or nine times a year. So right away, you need a lot more LSATs to fill in eight or nine test administrations. They hadn't spent a whole bunch of decades preparing for that. So they weren't exactly uh, flush with a whole bunch of test forms. But it gets worse from there for them. And this is what really triggered the decision that we were like, we can actually predict what they're doing. And that is, is that each test administration uh, in the past was just one LSAT. Everybody got the same scored test. Now with the at-home scenario... Uh, you have a completely different situation because they're worried about cheating. Yeah. So what did they do? They started using different tests every day. And I knew right then that with more LSATs and multiple versions of LSATs being used, that their ability to kind of like uh, have the catalog be entirely separate was limited and they were going to be forced to reuse tests in on multiple instances. That's just something that we understood about what was going on. Some of those test administrations, especially in the early days, had 40 or 50 different, you know, test combination forms, different, you know, four different types of reading comprehension were scored and tested over that day. And anybody who's listened to our podcast in the last several years knows that we kept saying, you don't need to have that many. And in fact, that's exactly what has happened. The number of test forms for each administration has gone down. But when you have a bunch of tests and a bunch of reuses, Uh, or a bunch of different test variations, you're going to get a bunch of reuses. And that's where we were able to figure out they don't have too many options. And when we looked back at our records, we could see that their 
choices were far more limited than you would expect. And that's when we started predicting this test. And I don't, we're deep into the double digits now in terms of <laughs> accuracy of being able to say, hey, they're going to use this test. And then they do that. We just crushed uh, the April and June tests after crushing the January and February tests. Well, we'll see, uh, and about, I've said we'll many, see about June. You're right about June. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm April certain, and then I think about I'm the June mini ball. Correct. I don't mind you getting ahead of yourself, but <laughs> we will see. Got ahead of myself. <laughs> I, after doing that June crystal ball, it almost feels like it's locked in. It's Yeah, uh, it feels like kind of once we say it, it's going to happen because that's been the case for so long now. We'll, we'll see. And this won't last forever. At some point, this golden era of um, either transparency or clairvoyance is going to probably come to some sort of an end. They'll, they'll squash yeah. it. But for now, I said a lot of fun. For now, just enjoy it. I was thinking about how the April and June crystal ball, ah, yes. that session was, was the one that kind of came through, but that was really only because April has come through and it was all sorts of accurate for that. So, in, in any event, the point is, is, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, there's dozens or hundreds of LSATs that they can choose from. Not really. And that until they can produce enough test forms to get out of that box that they're in, leaves us with the opportunity to go ahead and make these predictions and feel really comfortable about them. Yeah. This, of course, also- John said a golden era. Go ahead. No, that will come to an end someday. And when it comes to an end, we'll stop doing it. But for now, we still feel pretty good about it. Yeah. I think the second our confidence wanes to a certain point, we'll- We'll throw in the towel. Um, this also explains to a, a separate question that I get all the time, and I know you do too, is like, why aren't they releasing these tests now? Why is pretty much every LSAT by default non-disclosed for this opportunity to get more coverage from it so that they could reuse it in much the same way that they've reused this? Yeah, if they were to release every LSAT and have them disclosed, it used to be three out of every four LSATs was disclosed, they would quickly have no tests yep. to administer. So they can't. So they've shut it down. I've actually been surprised they've released any tests over the last couple of years. Let's let's go back and highlight a really interesting thing that I think a lot of times people assume to be the case that isn't. And that is that the section remained identical from the first time it was used until the very end. It wasn't. When it showed up originally, it there was obviously four uh, passages within this section. And I mentioned that the first one was a Freedom Riders passage. That's how it got released. But initially, when we saw this back in uh, 2011, and then through all those first four or five reuses, the first passage was about malaria. Mm -hmm. Then the second was about the prescriptive and descriptive grammarians, then shipwrecks, then international debt. And you go through 2014, through 2017, through the early flex tests in 2020, that malaria passage persisted. And then I think it was starting in the November LSAT of 2020 that all of a sudden we had people coming back talking about the shipwrecks passage and we're like, yes, it's that same reuse. And then they started talking about freedom riders. We're like, no, that's supposed to be malaria. <laughs> and this is a great way that we end up playing detective because we're like, look, the rest of this passage is the same. Um, they have clearly flipped out malaria for freedom riders, and we had complete information about freedom riders as well. We're like, that's a really interesting switch that they have actually made there. And so once they started using freedom riders instead of the malaria passage, they kept on with that all the way to the end until they finally released it. And if you go read the uh, PT-93 now, freedom riders freedom is the very first one, and malaria isn't there any longer. That's an unusual thing for them to do with a scored section to make changes to it over time. Usually when something is like a fixed scored section has been tested as many times as this has, uh, it's pretty much set in stone. So to see that swap was certainly interesting, um, but also I think somewhat distinctive. Very much so, but think about the amount of kind of like cat and mouse gaming that's going on yeah. there. That's a pure we confusion like, oh. move, I think. Very, I think there's probably some kind of statistical reason for it because we know that there was a huge scoring bubble in the middle of 2020 uh, that it might relate to. But, you know, John, we're like, UNESCO shipwrecks, we got this. Right. And then all of a sudden it's like something isn't right here. But this goes to show the level of knowledge that we have about all these non-disclosed test forms. And I think that's where a lot of times when people ask us about the crystal ball or the ability for us to make predictions, they don't understand. It's like, you can't do this without a massive effort at record keeping over the years and being able to say, 
I have all this information. I can see the threads of sections and tests and questions as they move through it. If we didn't have that, John, there is no way that we could make the predictions that we make now. There's no way we would have the confidence. Uh, and we've talked a lot about like, geez, it's amazing that we can actually predict tests and get it right from the reuse. Uh, and I think that's wholly because we have the kind of records in place. Nobody else has them, uh, but that really allows us to be able to do this. It's a huge benefit. Yeah, and look, it's it's Speaking not of benefits. it's not automatic. There is no like you know set algorithm to this. There's still some alchemy to what we do when it comes to predicting things and trying to anticipate. But you're right, man. The records are the backbone of it. So this thing got yeah. released as the real test PT93 plus in November 2022. What does that mean going forward for it? Well, the short answer, the only answer is you will never see it again on a real LSAT. It is done. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> There's been occasional mishaps, but they are few far between, you know. Hmm. Uh, so you can confidently say that it is over and done with, which is really interesting because for our purposes, when we're looking at possible test reuses, as soon as they release this test, which we knew got reused a lot, if any of you have been to the, the kind of like the crystal ball where I predict which tests will be reused, I've got those three columns. The very first column is either it won't be reused for sure or it's extremely unlikely. Right. This test now moves into that category. We won't put it into kind of like our prediction choices going forward because it's not going to reappear. And we won't have to then, when we get to the problem sets, account for the structure of this passage, which we had actually done. And I think this is where the, the real information about the value of the crystal ball comes in. All right, we know this section that we're talking about is interesting. We know that this passage isn't going to show up again. But what kind of benefits do students yeah. get from our ability to actually track this? I think that's the real payoff and the real question here. The key question, I think, yeah. Um, and one answer is that directly, not so much. And that's because whatever you have seen on an LSAT as a non-disclosed test that could be reused again, you will never see again. LSAT tracks test takers, uh, or at least they purport to track them closely. And sometimes people slip through the cracks a little bit such that they're never going to give the same content to the same person twice. So as much as you may remember your test from last year and it was non-disclosed, and you take it again this year as a repeat and hope to see the same thing come up again, it won't, at least not for you. So in terms of a benefit of seeing the same content again and being able to improve on work you've already done, that's not going to be the case. But there's a huge indirect benefit, and I think we've touched on it throughout this. Um, so let's touch on it once again. It's largely thanks to us doing the things that we do, tracking what we do. What it means is that when we know or highly suspect that a non-disclosed bit of content is likely to reappear again, we can find actual content, disclosed content that you can practice that is as close, as analog, as representative as possible. And we can prepare you for that future reuse, that non-disclosed content that's likely coming with something that is, again, just picture perfect, almost a facsimile of it. That is the best possible thing you could hope for when it comes to being prepared for this test. I've done a game exactly like this. I've read a passage that has this exact structure. That's exactly right. And it's also, you know, what we consider to be good preparation. Everyone talks about like you should do old questions. Well, why should you do them? It's because the past is prologue. <laughs> grouping is going to appear again on the LSAT. So if you do old grouping games, you get a sense of their style, some of the structures they use, the language that they have. The same thing is true for weekend questions or various reading comprehension passages. Structures and stylistic presentations, concepts that underlie them all kind of reappear. The difference here and what we're able to do for crystal ball students and ultimately power score students specifically is to say, if we have an even greater knowledge Knowledge of the likelihoods of what will appear, we can narrow the field of what you need to focus on, or at least make sure that you emphasize what we consider to be the most important and most likely to reappear concepts. When you look at a passage like this, 
And you think about that, you talked about the direct benefit being relatively low because they don't reuse it. The indirect benefit is huge. Yeah. We've seen the passage like this 12 times. If this was still in the rotation to be reused, we can go out and look for similar uh, passages, that application principle structure and so forth, and then tailor the problem sets that we're making to match that. Reading comprehension, it can be really broad. Logic Games is a great example of where it can be a lot narrower. And that is why students who've done those recommended problem sets come back and they're like, this was right in line with what I was looking at. Because we're, we have a pretty high likelihood right now of understanding what they're actually going to do. So when we sit down at the next crystal ball on June 29th, that's what we will have done. We will have looked at what they did in June. We will reduce the number of candidates. We will then reselect what we think are the most likely test reuses. We will then reshape the recommended problem sets and post them into our online student centers. And again, it, it's not something where you're like, well, you're going to see this exact passage. That's not what it is. But you're going to see something that is hopefully similar to what you see on your actual test. And the feeling of confidence when that happens, I can tell you from having talked to hundreds of students who have reported back, it's a massive surge of energy because you're like, I'm on this. And that confidence often equates to success on this test as we've talked about elsewhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. A uh, great example with games that comes to mind is a couple of tests back. You really emphasized that people needed to go do that virus game, that infamous virus game from September 2016, I believe. 16. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, one of the test forms that got used on that very next LSAT had a game that was as close to the virus game as any I've ever heard of. And we got that exact feedback from people. Well, split feedback. People who had done the virus game and understood it, as we advised, the feedback was just jubilant. Like, you guys are lifesavers, you're gods, thank you. The people who hadn't done the virus game weren't familiar with it and didn't know what to do. The feedback we got from them was uh, decidedly less celebratory. Mad at themselves was the feedback. And occasionally, which I would have occasionally mad at us, but that's not necessarily a fair take. No, I mean, we do everything we can, yeah. make it free even mm. up to this point. I think they were mostly mad at themselves. I, I wish I would have listened more closely, yeah. but it seems ridiculous. I mean, honestly, if I was a new LSAT student, I'd be like, there's no way this could be the case. And I'm, I'm amazed every day that it is the case. And that's why I've often said it will end at some point when LSAC spins up enough new test forms that there are too many out there for us to predict. That's when this goes away. That day will come. I hope it doesn't come anytime soon for all of our sakes, but it will come. But that, that, I think that's why sometimes we get questions, John, is like, that's ridiculous. There's no way you could do it. I'm like, go listen to it and then watch what happens. You'll be stunned. We've been stunned on a number of occasions that it worked, but after a while, it just becomes, you know, regular course of business. The job that we have, in our opinion, is to help prepare people for the test. A lot of that is saying, what do you think is going to show up on the exam? That's really what every LSAT preparation company is attempting to do is to prepare you beforehand for things that show up on the real test. We just have more knowledge than the rest of them combined. Yeah, combined. I was going to add that if you didn't. <laughs> So this because is, we've been tracking it for so long. Yeah, no yeah. one else has been tracking it like this for 20 plus years. No one else has the records that we have. And I don't think it's John and I being like, uh, you know, super amazing, even though I think we are. It's more a matter of the fact that the material that we're working from is so deep and so high level. It just gives us a built-in advantage that you can't get caught in the race. And that's where we're at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the caddy who's worked that same golf course for 60 years. He's just going to know stuff that nobody else is. That's kind of how this is. The institutional knowledge that we have because of the efforts we've put in and the attention that we've paid is just staggering. And here's how it begins to pay off. What I think is interesting, Dave, is you focus this one on a single passage that had caught your eye. Uh, reused, I think, 11 scored times over the years. Mm -hmm. This is actually still not their most popular test or section for reuse. Um, there's a, another candidate out there that they seem to like even more, and that still remains non-disclosed. They haven't actually put it out as a real test yet, or as a public test yet, I should say. 
Yeah, it's not it's not released to the public yet, which means it is still in the circulation for the options that they could use coming up. Maybe we'll do a part B podcast on this. We took, we've done a single RC passage, and hopefully it was interesting. For those of you listening, you learn a little bit about the way LSAC works. You learn a little bit about our level of understanding of what they're doing. And as I said, it's the cat and mouse game. I don't consider us to be in competition and if it is, it's a friendly competition. Yeah. You're just trying to best. You're trying to best the other person. And be like, ah, I got, I got this round. Maybe they get the next round. But perhaps we'll do a, a part B and we'll talk about that test. We, you know, one, the most frequently used test that we're aware of out there, and just go through the history of it a little bit. It's honestly jaw dropping when you realize how often some of these exams have been reused. You can only see it though with the perspective of history. If you show up and study the LSAT for a year, you'd never realize this was going on or at least going on to the depth of this. It's only when you start studying it for five years, 10, 15, 20, that you really see the scope of it. And you start to think to yourself, wow, some of these tests really track back into the 2000s. It's absolutely amazing. So maybe we'll do that as a part B. But at least for today, that covers part A, as I'll call it now. And that kind of interesting UNESCO shipwrecks passage. So if you haven't done it, go do it. And you'll realize, wow, this is actually a passage that's almost 15 years old, but they used over and over again. So they consider to be really a reliable predictor and indicator for their purposes. I like it. I like it. I wasn't sure how this was going to go. Sometimes you and I can get a little in the weeds, a little inside baseball with this, where we're mostly just scratching our own like LSAT nerd itch. Um, But hopefully people that listen to it not only have a better understanding of what's happening from LSAC, but also what we do and why it's valuable. So if that came through, uh, then I feel like I've earned this scotch. Yep. Possibly a refill. Possibly a refill. (laughs) Possibly. How about definitely? (laughs) All right. If you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it in the world. And if you've enjoyed it, leave us a comment and a rating. And pretty soon we'll be doing a mailbag episode where we take listener questions. And you can send those questions to lsatpodcast at powerscore.com. On behalf of John and myself, we hope you've enjoyed it and found this informative. Stay safe out there, and we will talk to you soon. 